Welcome everyone. We still have some people joining as we go along, but thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Melissa Zisengwe. I am program of site CTRN. We are a community of practice for the civic tech community in Africa, and we have invited Janice here to do a masterclass for us on storytelling. Um, it, the idea stems from um, the need for marketing and communications in our space. Well, that's what a lot of people in our space have been saying. So we thought we should do something, uh, some sort of capacity building for the community. So I'm just going to hand it over to Janice so that we don't waste any time and she will just get right into it. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Melissa. And thank you so much for the invitation to present. Um, uh, Melissa and I had had a, a journey a couple of years ago around community design and building of online communities. So welcome everybody. I'm absolutely honored to be here and, um, and talking about what I'm really passionate about, which is storytelling um, in communities. And I've just kicked over my selfie light, which was not clever. So I don't know if it's making any difference, but um, just by way of introduction, I started working in the online community space um, in 2011. And it happened because I got exposed to platform technology and um, I got exposed to a group in the state, in the state of Connecticut, where there was really a push for STEM in education. And what they wanted out of the state of Connecticut, which was a very highly driven engineering state was to get more kids interested in STEM careers and getting them going into um, engineering and, and similar. And what they did was they used the platform to drive the agenda and 11 Connecticut high schools set up private profiles. So when we talk about platforms, and I never wanna make assumptions, platforms are not websites, they are places that are driven by profiles. So the most common one you'd find and where the most easy to understand is, is Uber, where there's a profile of a rider and a profile of a driver and they find each other through the technology. Um, so this was platforms really in a similar vein made up of profiles and kids in high schools started collaborating in private profiles where they had engineers supporting them from the, uh, the engineering school, so tertiary students. And they also had an engineer from Sikorsky, a known aircraft manufacturer. And within these profiles, these kids were designing aircraft at the age of 14 and 15. And it got me so excited that I really thought, um, you know, how do I bring platforms to South Africa and start building communities in more of an impact environment. Um, so I've been working in the space for 11 years. Um, it's been tough because platforms weren't that known in South Africa and online communities weren't that known. People have often thought if there's a group on Facebook, they could be called an online community. And I'll talk to that in time. So to get on with the, the agenda, um, just in terms of setting the scene, what I really want to share today is how you leverage storytelling out of an online community, how stories can come from the community and this, how this in fact adds to the authenticity of the stories you need to and want to be telling. Um, so I've got a presentation, but I would really love to understand who's in the room and what your expectations are and what kind of organizations, because as I go through my presentation, I can possibly allude to examples that would be a benefit to you. And in the second hour of the workshop, I would really like to engage with you and really understand how I can support your storytelling and your building of communities to drive better stories and better traction and better stakeholder engagement. So if we could just um, unmute for, for a bit 
and maybe just um, go around and, and introduce ourselves. I think some of my team are here as well um, to join and, and support. Um, I can see a few people in the screen, but I think if I change to a gallery view, I might have to stop sharing. So fabulous, thank you. And welcome again to everybody. So I'm going to, it was really good to meet you and just understand what people's expectation and what you're looking for. Um, so I'm going to do my best to address as much of it as possible. Um, please, um, I'm at, at best an informal presenter, raise your hands um, at, at any time. So, so we're going to go through a short agenda of presentation, and then I really would like us to engage and uh, amongst each other because our experiences as a group, there's, there's such a wealth of experience in the room. So... Um, the importance of storytelling. Well, we know it, and it's something we're all looking to achieve. Um, and many have asked whether civic tech is, in fact, the missing link between decision makers and citizens. So just in terms of storytelling, um, when you deliver more than the facts, you create a shared experience. And, and we all come from a world of drawing up things called fact sheets and this is about the organization and this is the, the vision and the mission and the objectives and the hope for outcomes. But in fact, when we talk to how those outcomes affect people's lives uh, and livelihoods and democracy, et cetera, it is about the shared experience and it's a very different way of delivering it. Um, Facts, you know, uh, one organization's facts can look very similar to the next organization's facts. And how do we, in fact, differentiate them? And we do it through shared experiences. And that's how we keep audiences listening. Um, so if we, whether we're telling stories to those who would be the so-called beneficiaries of our project, or the stakeholders, the funders, or anyone else in the stakeholder ecosystem, it's important that we tell stories that drive them to listen. Um, and it does enable on a final note, the conversion of values into action. So just, just a note on that, it really, human experience is worth everything. Um, we can say we have implemented, um, I'm involved in an, a nonprofit that's in farming. Um, and I can, I can say we empower young African women in agribusiness, um, we drive agripreneurship, we capacitate them. But until one of those young women stands up and says, as a result of this organization, in fact, what I learned to do was um, identify the problem I'm um, solving or the gaps I'm addressing, and this is how far my business has come as a result of employed one person. Already, my narrative versus her narrative are, have completely different um, emotional strands running through them. So um, that, that really goes to the importance. And I know I'm preaching to the converted here. I just thought if we remind ourselves why we tell stories, uh, it motivates us to keep doing it and to do it better. So the concept of community, I, and, and this is really the space that is my, my comfort zone. It's a space I'm passionate about, as I mentioned, for the last um, 11 years. So what do we understand by community and where do we build it? I want to go back and um, everyone in the room, uh, maybe apart from me and one or two others, um, seem very young. But if we go into a pre-platform environment, if we go into a world where what we knew online were websites, websites are, as I think of them, as an information dump. It was driven by those who always uh, um, spoke. It was without real input from those who were affected. So you'd go to a website and it was rare that you'd hear a story from a beneficiary or someone who in fact had been um, affected by the specific organization. 
and we move into a platform environment and that's about shared voice it's thanks to technology we've got social platforms social media and the ability to capture content anywhere um, I always uh, refer to the pre-platform world as the dark ages, thus the black block, because I think it was the dark ages. We had this incredible technology. We'd put, um, I would say, people into space, but was a man on the moon. Um, and, um, you know, we'd achieved amazing things, but still information was very one directional. Um, and then platforms came along. So again, the distinction is a website can be brilliant, but it's really made up of pages and it's not designed for the collaborative era. In the collaborative era, which is where we find ourselves now, we find ourselves um, with places to share ideas, to share thoughts, to crowdsource, to crowdfund. Um, and that's what platforms allow us to do because um, I, as an organization looking to fund, could in fact go onto a crowdfunding uh, for impact platform and start raising funds. I could start a Facebook page, I could start a, um, uh, an Instagram, start sharing images, etc. So suddenly the flow is not so one directional, but in the world of social, we don't, in our organization, we don't believe that um, social media necessarily made everything better. So while we refer to the pre-platform world um, and the pre-world of sharing as the dark ages, um, there, was darker, there was darker days still to come or a darker age. And what do we mean by this? Um, so it's, it's uh, uh, everyone, who, anyone who reads what I post in my social media, which is actually completely restricted to LinkedIn, knows that I'm not a fan of social media and I'm not a fan of building communities there. And I think that they have to a large extent, while they provided this free space for communities to be built, and there's some great communities, you know, if I look for a rescue dog, I know where to go and look. Uh, if I'm looking for um, something to fund, I'll probably find them on Facebook. But at the same time, the free has not been so free because these platforms have really um, exploited the, the value that we as people bring. So they always say, if you're not paying for it, you're the product. And that's completely true of Facebook, specifically now called Meta. Uh, if you're not paying for it, you're the product. So why would you or wouldn't you build your community there? There are a number of reasons. One, you really want to build a space of trust where people feel trusting to tell their stories. And trust has been greatly eroded by those who follow um, stories around these mammoth technology companies um, and understand how they've shared personal data, how they've influenced elections such as Brexit, um, we would certainly never build a community on one of these platforms. So um, I believe there's an inherent danger to social media and having people tell their stories there. We know that algorithms really direct conversations, um, We've seen what's happened around the world. We've seen where people are possibly threatened by the immigration story, like in the case of Brexit, and, and um, really bombarded with, with images and messages that drive and influence their decision. We've seen what happened in the States around um, an accusation of a falsified election. Uh, we've seen some darkness around um, a lot of African context. So um, we always, um, I, I mean, it's almost you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't when, when it comes to something as big as Facebook or as big as Twitter. Um, but we would always say, absolutely proceed with caution. Um, I'm just going to check into... Ah, oh, that's fabulous. I'm going to, uh, Simon has shared in the chat about the Changemaker Network, which is great. I just wanted to see if there were any questions. Um, 
So yeah, it's, it's, it's a proceed with caution, but again, it is not, we would absolutely not recommend that communities and storytellings are drawn out of in, in social media. We think there's high risk to it. Um, so, th but the fact remains that it is important to tell stories within a community. How we do it is we start with a picture of the ecosystem. And, and when you think about communities, thinking about the whole ecosystem is important. Uh, what we used to do is we used to work in very linear ways and say, who are our stakeholders? So we have stakeholders who are highly influential or have low interest and high power. And we, have, we would have different um, matrices that we would work on to define who our stakeholders were and how we would communicate to them. And this again is in a pre-platform environment. So we would draw a lot of grids for stakeholders and say, this is how we need to communicate to the decision makers. This is how we need to communicate to uh, beneficiaries or people we add value to, et cetera. But today we really think in ecosystems. So the ecosystem I'm sharing here is one we've recently um, designed. We're starting to do work in, in some Johannesburg townships. And this one specifically is for Dipsluit. So the problem is that Dipsluit that has a non-census measured population, but estimated around a million, has something like 253 creches, baby care, early childhood development centers. The challenge is that they are poorly resourced. So very often the, the thinking is that the babies or the, or the um, little ones will be there and they'll be there simply for a place of warmth and safety. Um, they spend a lot of the day sleeping and not being stimulated because there just is not access to resources. So how do we start changing that? And this we need to think about. So we're doing this to start storytelling. We want the ECDs to start telling their stories and to start tracking through their stories how this narrative changes. So if in the center, and we're working with a well-established um, NGO trust in Depsluit, if at the center we say there's a, an ECD hub of 253 ECD stroke creches, who's in the ecosystem? And this is always our start point. We will always talk to everyone in the ecosystem and we will work hard to identify what they need. Because without understanding this, we don't really know what stories to tell. So for example, parents and families of children we believe they want their children like any other parent to be successful, to be a 21st century child who is um, academically and vocationally competitive, et cetera. The ECD practitioner, as much as they get the kids in there and they get them to sleep and they feed them when they need to and they keep them warm, um, we believe they would really, in, in, in the, um, at the root of their passion for being there is really to impart skills to the children. They simply, again, have no resources and in many cases don't know how or where to start. Our public sector um, needs data. They simply don't have the data and without data, there's little you can do to change a scenario. Then there are a bunch of partners, et cetera. So, and of course there are the funders and the DFIs and they want impact evidence and m and &E. This is an interesting one when it comes to storytelling because what we found in our world is that as much as we want to tell stories and DFIs and funders are moving to embrace a, narr a narrative, they are still very driven by numbers and charts and, and templates that one needs to fit, fill in. But, you know, it could be a case of us educating them and saying the stories are important because although our output may be we got toy libraries into 10 ECDs, the toy libraries may not be used. And until we 
to go into storytelling and capturing and having the experience of the ECD practitioners, we, we may never know what we've achieved. So this is how we generally tackle the start of thinking about building a community and a community that's going to be able to tell stories. So engaging the community in ways that matter. I'm using an example here of another community. So what we all work on doing, and I know that some of you have said uh, you come from a journalism background and you come from a data capture background and you, we, we tend to think often that there's only one way to capture a story and that's by someone telling it. But there are many ways to tell a story. So this is a community um, that lives on, on our education platform and it's a cross SADC community. So it engages at the moment 15 of the 16 um, member states in the region. And what we've looked to do is to say, so we have success stories coming in and they're coming in from schools around the continent. Uh, and that's fantastic. And they, they're lovely and, and they are often told by non-English speakers, which really adds to their absolute authenticity. But what are the other ways to start engaging people? One of the ways is to use a, um, a forum or a, a discussion a stream and and that's what we do a fair amount of so when I took the screenshot this was launched um, at the end of last week and it's really engaging in climate change so there are a lot of schools doing food gardens and within this discussion stream they can actually talk about their food gardens they can share images they can talk to how they're capturing the rainwater for the food gardens, and they are starting to engage with peers. So it's important um, not to simply constantly be asking, please tell your story, or tell us how this worked for you, or tell us how it was successful for you, but leveraging different tools that technology has to offer to get engagement working in different ways. So building a community where the communities tells, or building communities, excuse me, where communities tell the story. So in whose interest is it to tell the story? And how do we embrace the concept of storytelling champions? This is another community we work on, which is a community for African educators, where there are a lot of free resources. And what we started seeing, we did the typical ask the question, what motivates you to teach? What do you find the toughest thing about teaching today? Um, what's your reward in teaching? What can government do more of for you? So it was the typical tell your story in just sharing your pain point. But what you discover when you build a community that you are delivering to, there are people that start rising in the community to engage slightly differently to everyone else. Um, we call them champions. And so in every community, we find that as the minute you have a champion program, you start, um, and are they leaders? They, they're people who have embraced the community um, and will drive a different level of engagement and storytelling. So what we do is we really look for people across the community. And I have to say, I have to backtrack a little bit. Building a community is damn hard work. It really is. It's um, because people, one, have been exposed to so many platforms. In some platforms, there's been, um, their information has been used um, in, in, in nefarious ways. In some platforms, there be, there's been abuse where people have voiced opinion. Uh, they, so their trust is eroded. Um, and now we're asking them to join yet another platform where we're creating our community. And there, there are many, there are many uh, technologies out there. 
um, that, that have the ability to drive discussions and to have document libraries, etc. So building a community is hard and it's about keeping an ear to the ground. But once you build the community and you start building that level of trust and the fact that you hear the different stakeholders and you understand their needs and you deliver to all of them, that's the time when storytelling actually becomes a possibility. And champion programs, whatever you call them, we've chosen to call them a champion program. It's a very, uh, it's, it's quite American, but uh, it works for us for now. But um, it's a very good way of, of leveraging because champions become drivers of other stories as well. So as much as it's kind of a hard nine yards building the community and this community, we've launched our first champion and we are, I think we're in our second, close to the end of our second year of this community. Um, having shared many free resources, having thousands of people visit the community, having thousands of free documents downloaded, we only now are finding that we're actually able to know champions. Uh, and in fact, one of my team, uh, Lengi, has just joined us and she was busy doing an interview with, with uh, Bida. Um, and so we're inviting Bida to write a blog um, about uh, education. Uh, Bida is in South Sudan. Um, so small, they only have uh, 10,000 teachers there, but we're inviting a blog. And this starts also adding credibility to others who would like to tell their story or who may tell their story because they see their peers engaging in storytelling. And, um, and honestly, there's no harm in a bit of recognition and accolade in your community. It, it goes a long way. So how do you leverage your tech and drive early engagement? Um, sorry, I've, I've jumped. So I would like to, uh, one I'd like to open up to any questions out of what I've presented so far. Um, and then I want to start talking um, to you as a group. So I'm going to again, shut down this, this um, presentation and really start engaging in what are the challenges in extracting stories? Um, how are they shared? Um, in some cases, we use a little bit of a design thinking process to understand our ecosystem. And just in the design thinking, we gather stories. And I'll explain more of that as well. So maybe I could just um, close down the slide for a while and open up to questions. So I have um, a question. Are there any other options that organizations could use instead of social media for storytelling, especially in countries with low tech and big digital divides? It's, um, it's a hard one for me to answer because we're so in the tech space, but it's a question we get so often. Um, and you know, without uh, the opportunity for face-to-face -face engagements, um, it's really tough. What we look at, and we look at how quickly um, there will be acceptance of mobile and better data. At the moment, smartphone proliferation in Africa is, um, according to GMSA, which is the big global body, is at about 67%. Um, and we, we can only hope this, this will increase. Uh, when I had a first conversation with Bida from South Sudan, he also he said teachers in rural areas simply have no access to anything. Um, so apart from going and really recording stories um, uh, on video or, or in, in written format, 
I don't know that there's another way. And then sharing them through tech with a community that will absorb and consume them. Are there any questions that I may have missed? Um, so Samuel is asking what materials tools should be used for storytelling? So, oh, great, Yvonne, I see your hand, thank you. So to go to Samuel's question in terms of, of materials, it's very dependent on who you're telling the story to. Um, we personally think that video is, not we think, it's, it's proven, video is more consumed and more readily consumed than the written word. People have become so lazy to read because they've got so much access to video material. So video is, um, is absolutely uh, a way to capture the stories. In, in addition to that, um, I, I think that Again, if it goes to who your audience are, I, I don't know when last anyone saw a newsletter, for example. I haven't seen one for a very long time, and I'm not sure that I would read one right now. So um, good blog spaces. Um, we use blogs a lot, but we may even insert video into the blog itself. So we find video one of the most powerful mediums for storytelling. Uh, Yvonne, I'm going to go to you, and then I see uh, hosts have asked that everyone thereafter just pop their questions into the chat. Okay. So, um, thank you, Janice. So, if I heard you correctly, did you say radio? No, video. Video. Okay. Okay. So, um, back to the ecosystem, like, you know, um, technology as... Um, help to amplify a lot of issues and for our project for example we work with young people from 18 to 40 years old and these are people you find on social media um what is the best way um to tell stories on social media with these demographics that we have online it's it's a really interesting question um thank you yvonne and I think, you know, when your demographic is so wide, um, so I'm, I'm not a social media expert, but more of a, a private online communities um, specialist. But what I do know about social media is that um, there's quite a, in terms of meta, previously Facebook, there's quite a big drop off of the younger generation. They certainly more interested in things like TikTok um, and the more easily consumable media. And I think that is a way. Uh, so I think that you, it's important to look at your demographic and know there isn't a single story for a demographic that wide. So for an older demographic, and actually radio remains, um, remains a popular medium in many countries. Uh, we've gotten so accustomed to social that we've forgotten about radio, but there are certain demographics, especially slightly older demographics, who certainly consume a lot of radio. But I think the best thing in storytelling demographic is so wide is to really understand, are the youth um, still accessing something like Facebook or is it about TikTok or Instagram? Um, so it's, it's, it should be demographically driven against the medium that you choose. Thanks, Janice. Thank you. You're welcome. So would, would anyone like to share um, any successes that you've had with storytelling, uh, how you've captured and, and where you've shared them? Okay, so for our project at GoVote, we have um, champions across communities, about 850 of them across 15 states in Nigeria. And what we have um, done with that um, using social media is to amplify um, 
the role that these champions are playing at the grassroots level to um, help community members um, register. And this has generated a lot of questions. We have um, been able to help a lot of people solve um, their issues concerning their, their PVC registration, the PVC, the permanent voters cards, such as question, okay, where's the um, closest location to me? I have um, issues with transfer, what do I do? I registered in 2018, I have not picked up my card, how do I do about it? So using um, the, the Champions um, platform has helped us to um, reach more communities. So I'd like to stop there. Fantastic. And if anyone else would like to share, please share, because uh, once you've done that, I want to find out from the group, do you measure how your stories are consumed? Do you have a way to know how many of your stories have been read, downloaded, watched, etc.? Okay, for, for the Go Vote project, um, with, uh, what I just explained, one way we have uh, measured it is the number of responses and comments that we get on our posts. And also, um, the when you go to the um, Twitter, for example, there's a place where you can get analytics to know the number of impression, how I many people have seen this information. And, you know, so that's one way um, we get our uh, how we measure from, from Twitter, for example, number of feedbacks that we get and the number of impression just showing the number of people that, that have either seen it or um, read through the information, not necessarily taking action, but the impression just shows that this information has reached X, Y, Z number of um, people. Fantastic. Anyone else want to share? So what I'm going to share with you is some uh, yeah. of the, sorry, did so, please go ahead. Oh, yeah. Um, we also just like what has just been shared right now. Um, we use social media as well as MailChimp for newsletters. Um, so each platform has its own um, like analytics that you can actually download. Um, so we use that in, uh, to measure uh, engagement and how each post or story is 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 doing online, um, and that is done and reviewed on a monthly basis so that we can actually tweak strategy going forward as to what kind of content is more is consumed more by 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 the readers. That's brilliant. So so we do pretty much the same, um, and I'm going to share with you. So this is some of the storytelling. This again is in this in the community, the SADC education community. Um, and I'm looking so, so we know that this blog, which came from a school, um, has had 168 views. And so, and, and what's very clear is that um, these real, these stories that come out of a place of this absolute authenticity are stories that are well consumed. Um, so these are the kinds of stories, and they're often written by someone in the school itself. Um, uh, they don't always arrive with the, um, the, the best quality pictures, but I don't even know that that's, that's so critical. So I'm trying to get to some of the more um, uh, school stories. Um, and these are, as you can see, they're fairly, you know, they're fairly well consumed. There's 200 views. Um, so for us, measurement is really important. What we also do is, in, in our case, we measure our, our wikis. So, sorry, I'm probably making everybody dizzy. And that also drives um, how, how people, um, how we drive the, the content to come. Um, so, so this page, for example, has had 
uh, just over four and a half thousand unique visits and we can see where people are going. So where is their interest? Where are they going? Are they reading the blogs, etc.? cetera? Um, we have found, and, and I find this on, on an ongoing basis, we often are, um, we take in some analytics and we're surprised when our output thereafter doesn't work. So what am I talking about? So we do use, for our teacher communities, we do use social media because it's the place to attract them. But we're hoping to attract them into a safe private community space where uh, their data won't be mined, et cetera. Um, we've tried things where we think they, that teachers really want to share challenges. And we keep on asking questions. And on some questions, we'll get the most outstanding response. And then we'll keep asking them. And suddenly, it proves the exact opposite of what you expected. And this is where we find design thinking is really important to engage in the process of storytelling. So um, just to touch on design thinking and how we use it in storytelling. Um, often the case is, so with design thinking, it's really putting yourself in someone's shoes. What is your day like? So if it's about um, African educators, what is the day like? Take, walk us through it, tell us about it. And often out of this emerges the possibility to tell stories. So teachers will often share with us, for example, that um, we've picked up a lot that discipline is a massive issue in schools and, and not, not just, we, we would think just in South Africa and outside of South Africa, kids are all well behaved. It's not the case. It appears that discipline is a major issue and actually COVID and the absenteeism affected this enormously. So just through a design thinking process, when you don't specifically target the story you think you want, through a design thinking process and what we call empathetic listening, stories will emerge. Um, it, it's, it's hard to be the custodian of storytelling. And the minute you can hand custody into the community, that becomes you know, a, such a stronger place to be doing it. And that's why we advocate. So we often start with empathetic listening. We don't make, we try not to make assumptions. It's a very hard thing to constantly do. But then um, we try and hand over and really get the community to start coming up with ideas uh, and sharing stories. Um, I'm going to share an, another example of how we've very successfully implemented um, using different tools to generate stories. So you'll forgive me because I am on one of our platforms, but it's our, our best use cases because it's where we have our experience. So, so this, for example, we put this as a placeholder and I think it's the worst thing. I think it's not gonna generate one story, but the client was in the middle of a rebrand. And so we, we left it there. This, this, although we put it up, I would not advocate as a good idea for storytelling. Um, uh, there's nothing that strikes anyone that I need to tell my story here. But what has been successful, for example, is, um, so here you can see school governance. School governance drove a lot, not massive commentary, but um, fairly significant views. And that already tells us something. So people in all likelihood do want to share their stories, but there's an anxiety to doing it. And as I mentioned previously, there's often a massive trust factor to, to sharing stories. Uh, where will it be shared? Will I be... Um, misquoted, will my story be told the way I would tell it, etc. And people have not always had good experiences in the social media um, space, so they are hesitant to tell their stories. But we feel that when people come and look at things, and we use this in our community building model, people looking, uh, a progressive step to looking is sharing. 
sharing, commenting, and possibly telling stories. So communities go through um, an evolution process. And for as long as you keep serving the community, they will resist serving themselves. So in the world of community, for as long as you keep uh, sharing the information, writing blogs for people, doing interviews for people, they will become accustomed to this is what you do and we are the readers. So it's very important to, to tip that balance and start driving community evolution where you find a community will in fact go from, um, uh, from an expectation of being a served community to understanding that they are part of knowledge generation. Um, some of the other tools we haven't used for a while, but we have used successfully in the past. It's just, just um, uh, share, your, share a thought on a, a one-liner. So while people may get to storytelling eventually through an evolutionary process of a community, they may not be ready to share a whole story, but they may be ready to share a pain point or an idea just like teachers are struggling with um, classroom discipline, et cetera. So what I'd like to do is I would really like um, everybody who's on the call just to think of one new way to generate a story. Um, one way that you, something that you've possibly heard from this something that, and I'd love to go around the room and just hear your thoughts. Is there something that you've learned um, that you can use to leverage in your community that you can think about either extracting the story differently or having it told differently or having the community tell the story? And it is a workshop, not a pure presentation. So now I'm allowed to put you all on the spot. Who's going to volunteer to go first? Um, Janice, there is a question in the chat before ah, you go. Thank you. Um, could you say something more specific about what design thinking is in this context? Yes, thank you, Doug. That's a really, um, it's, it's a nice question. So we want to tell stories and maybe we want to tell the stories of the success of our program. But um, we may also want to tell stories about the problem we're solving um, and almost timeline our stories from what we discovered, why open data is important, why um, it's important that youth vote, etc. So when we get into the community and we leverage design thinking, just that empathetic listening may spark stories. So I'll give you an example and I'll go again to the farming project that I'm involved in. So we always think that the problem we're solving is, is that women are so marginalized in agriculture and across the continent, they make up 50% of the agri labor force. And the fact that they don't have, um, often there's cultural or social reasons that they're unable to own land, et cetera. So we think it's about land ownership. We think it's about access to funding. Um, and when we apply design thinking, and we do that in our program, when we apply to these women, um, there's a whole host of other socioeconomic issues that come to the fore that are worth uh, telling stories about. So when we did the design thinking process with our first cohort of agripreneurs, two out of, out of our 12 young women was only in agriculture because of gender-based violence. They had suffered at the hands of, of some GBV abuse. Um, they both ended up in women's shelters and the women's shelters, one of the programs was agriculture and they found themselves there and they grew a passion for it. And so we don't always know 
what drives is is agriculture generational are we going to tell the story that these um these young women have families farming in remote and rural parts of of the country and they want to carry on the tradition what is the story we're telling so once we start listening why are you in agri what are your challenges with agri uh, our current cohort cohort no one has a land issue they all have land um so we, we make assumptions in telling the story that women are marginalized, they have no land. It's not always the right story. Um, I hope I've answered your question and please do tell me. Great, thank you. So I, I really would like us to kind of almost brainstorm with each other as to what are the different stories we can tell, how can we extract them differently, what are different delivery mechanisms that we can use. Is anyone here building a community already um, where, where the community know that stories from the community are actually welcomed? Um, Would anyone volunteer to kick this off? Doug? Yeah, just a couple of ideas. I mean, there are two things that come to mind. One is um, sparking a conversation between two people in the community, uh, two or more people, around them remembering a significant experience or event. Um, they 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 gen they kind of they catalyze each other so that's quite a helpful way of drawing out um and you know it, it you you're probably familiar with the phrase of the danger of a single story yeah um, which is one way of getting very different angles and interpretations and nuances from people and it's often quite energetic as well to do that a one-on-one -on -one interview is okay for some people other people in a close-up, they find it very difficult. So that that can be helpful. The other thing, which I've never tried, but I've only heard of, um, I, I've worked with people who who, who work with video. Um, there's an organisation called Insight Share, who have a remarkable practice, and what they do is they give uh, they give a, a you know community leaders or people in in community organisations give them a video camera you know, for a few days and, you know, obviously show them how to work it and then just say, just record, you know, things, good conversations, times when you're working together, when they're not there. And so, and often people get very used to a camera actually. Uh, and sometimes an incredible story emerge, I've heard, um, out of that, uh, really, you know, giving them the, 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 the tool. To, to tell their own stories and taking yourself right out of the picture. So that's, those came to mind. Yeah. I, I love that because I think that um, peer sharing, you know, there's a sense of, of understanding and empathy and no threat to, to really telling your story with authenticity. So I agree, getting the community to engage directly uh, with each other is, and, and taking yourself out is, is a great way. Um, Yasmin, I think you were next. Uh, yes, uh, um, I just have, uh, just to add to what Douglas was saying, um, I think that is quite a powerful tool, um, the, the video option, um, but also using just like handing out Disp disposable cameras or if people already have access to smartphones asking them maybe prompting them with a question and then they can start to take photos in their environment and maybe think about what that photo uh, elicits in them um, so mm -hmm. it can be a photo accompanied with some text um, and I also just thought of it now but maybe a way of just recording on your voice notes on your phone um, and then maybe coming back together and then sharing those and then building a narrative around that. 
Fantastic. I, I must say, we uh, I, I completely forgot about that, but we did a voice note request, just leave a message on a WhatsApp. Um, and we actually produced a short video out of it. So again, it was teachers challenges through COVID and we got comments from teachers all over the continent and you could simply hear by the accent and some we could acknowledge who they were, but, but some we simply didn't know and they were happy just to leave the comment and some spoke um, for a, a minute or two, which is a fairly long voice note on what the year under COVID had meant to teachers. Um, and as I say, we then curated that into a video. Um, yeah, so it's a great way of doing it. Um, Simon. Um, thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I'll speak a little bit about it, but also just a call for ideas on how we could use more innovative um, storytelling methods as well. So as Doug mentioned, we're doing this collaborative storytelling um, project, which is bringing together um, 20 uh, small town based change makers um, through online platforms. And they're going to be um, going through the barefoot uh, process that, that Doug convenes. Um, and then in combination with that, um, so, so, so he'll be kind of working with them to lift the learning that they already um, uh have are experiencing and then kind of draw out i mean maybe doug can speak a bit more about it um draw out the collaborative learning that that kind of the cross-cutting learning um and then we working with accountability lab um they have these integrity icons where they use um uh, emerging videographers to um to tell the stories of these um to basically name and fame public servants um that that are doing good work and kind of going above and beyond the, the call of duty um, rather than the usual approach of only kind of attacking people when things aren't going well and to try and almost <clears throat> make these as aspirational figures to inspire others to, to, do the, to do the same. So we're going to use that same approach, but with with these change makers. Um, so I, th I think that kind of videographer or the videography complementing the stories is one slightly innovative way. And then um, the online and then combined with an in-person um, collaborative storytelling workshop. Um, but if people have ideas of, um, we're now going to actually be putting this out in a call for funding. Um, we are putting some internal funding towards it, but we, we're needing some additional funding. And so if you have ideas of how we can use um, especially these online platforms, I think it would be really useful um, for us. And, and we have 200 uh, people that are involved in small towns and change making in some form, currently part of our network. Um, and it would be wonderful to see how that the storytelling platforms could be used. It's, it's currently entirely online that we run those. And and uh, absolutely, and we we can absolutely uh, chat about here or, or offline if that makes more sense. Um, but um, you know, if if we think about it, we have people have, have are telling their stories. They are they record themselves. They put themselves on YouTube on on TikTok. I mean, they're not not always stories to inspire, but um, but people are, and we are in a, an absolute era of people photographing, filming, um, talking, telling, um, and just to shift um, the trend into ways that support our organizations. Um, uh, I think collaborative storytelling is is a fabulous way of doing it. Um, I think it's 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 not a once off workshop and it'll happen. I think it'll take some energy and effort, but I I, I love the idea. Ivan. Hi, Janice. Hi. So, yeah. I really want to know um, um, what's the relationship. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. What's the relationship between design thinking and storytelling? Um, what's the connection? And also, um, I want you to dwell on um, the role of technology 
in storytelling. Okay. Yes, those are my two contributions for now. And can I just ask you, do you use design thinking methodology? Have you used it before? Yes, I have, but um, not for storytelling per se. Okay. Yeah, so, so that's why I want to really have like a clear um, distinction on how it works. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, and, and Doug said something earlier, I um, uh, said, we all know the, uh, the line, the danger of a single story. And in fact, um, uh, when uh, Melissa from the network had contacted me, I actually proposed that as the opening line of the workshop um, to say the danger of a single story. And I think that's where design thinking comes to the fore because, um, if we just, one, if we determine we're the custodian of the story, us as the storytellers of our communities, we are going to capture them. We come with um, often with a very specific mindset and frame of reference, and that is the danger. So, um, so if we go into an interview or story capture or information capture scenario, we're coming at it from what we know at the time. When you go into design thinking and you sit with the community, you understand that the context is, is more layered. Um, and, and I think that's where it benefits storytelling. I know Doug's put up a comment here, which I'd love to see. Yes, so those are exactly, so the five steps are empathize. So, uh, so if you look at Doug's list, so empathetic listening, you're going to tell someone's story or a community story. And this could even be applied in, in um, Doug and Simon's collaborative workshops. So what, what is the day like? So I am the enterprise development head of, or I'm a small business in an under-resourced area in a small town. What is my day like? We want to tell your story because we think it's you don't get enough customers, you don't have the resources to make your craft. So we make assumptions, but and, and we come up with the solutions from the assumptions we've made. But when you take that first step, so uh, empathize is empathetic listening. So you're listening to people's, um, whatever their, their journey is, the people whose story you intend to tell or help tell. Uh, you're then going away and saying, this is how we understood it. So we understood that the entrepreneur in the small town in the under-resourced areas challenge is not really that he has lack resources because he's making recycled crafts. So he's got the resources, but what he, um, uh, his problem is that he can't be found. It's simply a problem. He's off the beaten track. So we make assumptions. So we go back, we say, okay, so is this your, your story? So you've defined it to him and and he may say, yes, yeah, sometimes I can't be found, but people don't think they should, my crafts represent local things. So it's almost a, an iterative process design thinking. So you've empathetically listened. You've gone back to say, this is how I understand your story. Um, possibly you've ideated a solution. So why don't we tell your story this way? And in the case of design thinking, um, you know, the rest of it is really you prototype a solution. So this is what your solution could look like. But it's really, for me, the part of design thinking is that absolute empathetic listening and almost defining as you understand the challenge. And that helps for us, that helps a lot with storytelling. With the ECD story in Depslut, that was definitely an issue. You know, I could make assumptions that the women who run the ECDs are very happy for the children to come and sleep and you know just have a safe place, but they're not. Once we applied design thinking and we sat with these women, what we understood from them was they really want these children to progress. They want to know what a two-year-old should be able to do. Should they be able to balance, look up at a light, point at the sun? They don't know any of these things and they want to know them. 
we made an assumption that this wasn't the truth. So it allows us to tell the story differently. Oh, thank you so much, Doug. Um, so, oh, sorry, uh, Yvonne, you had us, uh, did we answer your question? Yes, you have answered the first one, but the second one yes. on the role um, technology plays in amplifying story or in storytelling, um, I think Christine okay. should on that. So, so technology, there's this it's such a broad space in itself technology because technology can include a whatsapp group but it can include meta stroke facebook or it can include twitter or a private uh, platform the the role that technology pay, plays is multifold uh, to start with the role of technology is it creates, it enables you to create a community. And that's what we do. We, we create communities to tell their stories. So we try and remove ourselves from the custody of stories and start highlighting the community's ability to tell their own stories. Um, and that could be a three, four, five year journey, but technology allows you to do that. Because what happens is, as you evolve a community, and, and I mentioned previously, your community may come on and some may immediately want to post a story. Some may immediately want to post a comment. Some may just want to look and not post anything, but they may over time evolve. So technology, if you create a space that's a trusted and safe space, it enables you to evolve your community um, and share knowledge with them. Uh, technology is very much about knowledge sharing, ideating, generation of, of um, uh, challenges and ideas against them, etc. And it captures all, all the information in one space, especially if you're using a platform. If you're using technology that has what we call an activity stream, like a WhatsApp or a Facebook, new people joining may not ever see that commentary. Um, so we like technology that works towards knowledge management, um, the ability to almost, and, and, and I use this word so loosely, but democratize engagement. So if I'm in a community, if I'm a member of, of a Facebook group, in all likelihood, I mean, I won't have admin permission and I won't have it on my platform either. Um, but on my platform, once I see a champion like Emmanuel Bieder, who I shared earlier, I may well give Emmanuel more rights to do more things because I know that he's going to be an advocate and a storyteller in that community. So there's, there are so many ways that technology enhances this, but you want it not where people see it once and never see it again, like a WhatsApp group. I mean, I've connected to WhatsApp groups and been part of a conversation that I have no context to. And that's not helpful for me. So you want a space where conversations are captured in order to create better stories. Thank you. Great. Any more? I, I love the innovative ideas um, that, that came in. I loved um, the sharing, the collaborative workshops, the WhatsApp, uh, leave a voice note. Um, there's a lot you can do with that as we shared. Um, any more ideas of, of anything anyone in the group is doing or has thought of doing in terms of storytelling innovation? Okay, so we, we 
Uh, did, sorry, did anyone else want to share? I'm just checking there's nothing in the chat. So I'm going to go back to, um, I'm going to go back to my slides. I, I am in, on my last slide and then I really would like to open, the idea is really to open to more conversation. Um, but I think the key takeaway is that stories are the most powerful way to engage stakeholders. What we also find is, and where we have communities and we have all these different stakeholders, we really try and storytell not from one perspective only. So there's often a, a temptation to just tell the stories of the beneficiaries or those that have the most critical challenges in an ecosystem. But to tell the stories of those who champion the solution is also important. And, and that makes for power. Um, and so we try to tell everybody's story in our communities. We also believe trust and authenticity are essential. And without that, the community will never come to the fore. Um, and we think, you know, don't delay in building a community because they do start becoming the voice. Don't delay in starting that process of evolution. Um, I think of uh, the small towns um, and the network created. Um, when we start uh, hosting conversations between stakeholders that share similar challenges, it's amazing what one can learn. And Doug, I'm not sure if that's what's, what's in mind when you talk about um, collaborative storytelling workshops, but um, often when you put peers in a room and challenges are shared and, and solutions are shared, it really gives rise to a lot of stories that you didn't even know existed. Um, and I think that's another value of, of community. So I'm going to I'm going to open the floor. I would really love to hear from more of you on how you're currently telling stories and any innovations. Um, I'm just looking at the list of attendees and who we haven't heard from. We've got a few people from Open Up, which I know very little about, and I wonder if you could share how you're telling your stories. Uh, Janice, I don't think either of them are here anymore. I think they uh, were for me. Okay. Um, is there anything anyone would like me to answer? Because I honestly can talk for hours, but I really want to rather find a way to engage, to answer questions um, like those that have already come forward. Maybe I could just chip in something that we grapple with. Um, we find that quite often when people tell their stories, they, are, they often are just skimming the surface of what really happened. Um, and it may or may not be interesting, um, but we know that there's always far more to it. I mean, you know, just look at any of us here. Um, we could tell you a, a, a story but there's far more, you know, there's much more going on inside us. So we, we came up with a notion, um, we call it the outside story and inside story. And the process is, is firstly, so, so we do this in a fairly structured way through writing workshops. Um, we've, we've also done it um, um, orally, um, but then have, have somebody actually writing up what people say on flip charts, because it needs to be made visible. Uh, it, or it, it helps if it is made visible. But the idea is to help people to, first of all, tell the story as they would, as they just remember it. But then to go back 
through the story and say, say a little bit more about this. What were you feeling? How did you respond to those feelings? You mentioned earlier, you know, what assumptions were you working on? You know, what are you, and how did your assumptions maybe change? So there's a whole set of questions that helps to um, dig up a little bit, uh, you know, what, what was not so visible. Um, and you find that when you do that, the story deepens immensely. Yeah. Particularly, um, you know, what if, uh, 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 prompting people around what they were feeling. Your emotional content is, is I, I think we misunderstand how important emotions are. Um, you know, imagine if we didn't have emotions, what would we be? You know, we'd, we'd just be biological robots. You know, our emotions really define. We experience the world immediately through our emotions and only next through our thoughts and through our um, considered intentions. So helping people to you know, follow, the, follow the feelings and you, it often leads you to where the real story lies. Um, easier said than done, because people are, are, you know, when you, when you try and get people to go deeply, they start, their, their defenses often start to come up because you're also asking them to be quite honest. Um, you know, we, we, we're, and, and people also have mixed feelings. That's another thing to, to, you know, you can love someone and hate them at the same time. We know that. Uh, but helping people to kind of surface those nuances can be quite a challenge. Um, and yeah, I thought I'd throw that into the pot. Um, it, it, it does help quite a lot if you can somehow catalyze or facilitate bringing out the inside story. Yeah, absolutely. There's a there's a, a business technique that does something, but not on such an emotive level where someone says something and you say why, and it's called the the, the five whys. And it just takes a layer down, a layer down, a layer down. Um, you know, I think we should uh, target this group of why because they are engaged in X, Y. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a very important one. I, you know, I, I come from years ago before my platform community life, um, quite a brand world. And there is a brand and I think it's a, a brand with heart. And if you want to go and look and, and, at good storytelling, it's a brand perspective, but again, it's one with absolute heart go to Patagonia. So Patagonia is a brand, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a brand similar to any outdoors, Cape Union Mart, I suppose, in South Africa. So it's outdoor gear, it's outdoor active gear, but they are expert at, at getting their customers to tell stories. Um, and it's some of the uh, in throughout my brand life, and I still use it, as you can see, as an example, um, Patagonia. I think there, there are a few Patagonias in South Africa now, I'm not sure elsewhere in, in Africa, um, but it's worth looking at their art of storytelling. So I, I think that's a fantastic question, Samuel. What are the qualities of good storytelling? Um, and I think, I mean, there are a few of us in the room that come from journalism backgrounds, me included. Um, and and it's, it's, it's the exact opposite of journalism where it's about reporting the facts. And this is reporting the beyond the facts. Um, and I think good storytelling is, um, you know, if, if, if the intention is to get, give your reader a sense of the, the heart of what's going on, whether it is about youth voting or small town successes or um, access to data and data privacy, I think that good story, the good story is the one that absolutely includes 
that level of feeling, a sense of feeling. Um, you know, when when our data rights are infringed or when human rights are, what does it mean? How do people feel? Uh, how has it impacted them? It's it's quotes from people. So it's it is beyond just factual. It's it's more about a sense of 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 the reality of it. Um, you know, if, if you look if you look around the world now, so I do a quick online update of the news um, and read that that in Ukraine and Russia, for example, a shopping center was just targeted. But I've I've gone on to a BBC podcast where they're actually speaking to people who were in around and they saw people and then they didn't see people. And just the absolute emotiveness of that um, leaves you remembering. And the fact that I'm actually repeating the story shows you the impact it had. Any more questions? And Melissa and Sihle, I think, um, uh, as I say, I could, you know, I could talk forever, um, but I don't think that's what people need from me. I think what we needed was to really target in on stories. And I, I love that people share their innovation. Um, I think that's hugely valuable about um, from sessions like this one. Oh, hi, Janice. <laughs> Hi. Um, so if there's any no more questions, we are happy to close the session. Uh, we will send out the recording and uh, the slides. And I think that's it. So we will save everyone about 20 minutes. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so yes. much, everybody. It was an absolute pleasure to be here. Ah, Samuel's got something. Yes, I, I just um, thank you so much. Yes, I wanted how often can this be to improve on the stories that we're working on? How often can this kind of training knowledge share be so that it works, uh, it improves us? Like, like for me personally, I learned a lot and it's improved uh, some of the things that I was doing uh, based on because uh, some way or the other. I, I tend to mentor some uh, youths on how to can put stories. I, as I talk, I am a trained journalist, always worked with the, with the stories, and I, I have learned things that I have not learned it before, but I felt it, it is okay when it, it's organized, maybe in a, in a frequent time, that one can easily learn, and then the stories that comes from the community, because it is uh, people's voice, community voice, that makes up the story, what the, the success the community of what the community need actually is developed from them. And then we see it is put out as you talk, the means where they can be in the media, it depends on which people the story need to reach to. So uh, basically I wanted to ask like how often can this be so that we get to know and we improve, thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Uh, I can partially answer that one, um, and then I'll give it to Janice. So we as CTIN usually do uh, a couple of capacity building trainings once in a while, and this was just one of them. Um, but uh, in terms of storytelling, I think that's Genesis uh, area. So you would have to go to their website. Um, Genesis, I don't know if you have any more information and I think then you'll find more resources on their website. Absolutely. So please visit it. And um, I'm, I'm very happy to support. Um, I don't, don't have any sessions planned, um, but I'm very happy um, to to support some sessions if there's if there's a requirement um, for one what I am going to share which I think is really valuable um, 
a few years ago, I did a course online with a, a very well-known author, marketer called Seth Godin on how to tell a story. And I also follow a podcast that I'm putting up on the group called themoth.org. Uh, they've also just published a book. They're 25 years old, themoth.org, and it's how to tell a story. And it's a book I've actually ordered. Um, but um, Samuel, I'm very happy to uh, reach out to you. I've got your email. I'm just going to make a note of it. And um, yeah, very happy. But please go and look at the moth.org. It's really an incredible place for storytelling. I think we can finally close. <laughs> I've shared um, your link on the web on the chat uh, to your website, Janet. Um, after that, uh, we will try to share as much information as we can in the next uh, couple of days. Um, and when we do have more trainings, we will definitely email everyone and let you know of the next training. Um, and if we decide to do um, any training linked to, to storytelling, we'll definitely invite Janice again. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for sticking around. I know it's a long session but I think it was necessary to have one of these long sessions uh, and we really appreciate the participation from all over Africa um, sorry I can't put my video on it's because there's load shedding and I'm using my phone to connect but I'm here so thank you everyone have a good day and we'll see you again next time